So as Pastor Shuli said, uh, we're going to continue our Cultivate series. And uh, I, I know that my wife and I are very, very different. My wife and I, Laurel. Um, but I noticed a new thing that we're different about the other day. We were driving, and uh, she is a maximizer. Um, if you don't know what that means, it means uh, she knows the better way to do everything. And we'll, and we'll let you know about it. Um, but uh, she pointed out to me that I'm a maximizer when it comes to driving. And she loves to drive uh, when we're together. And I don't know if that has anything to do with control. But um, I also love to tell her how to drive. And she loves to use the map, even when she's like going to places she knows. And I'm like, I don't understand why you would use the map. And she's like, well, dummy, it tells you if there's a traffic accident or a tri whatever. And this morning, literally coming from work to church, three exits or three entrances to the on-ramp of the freeway were shut down for me. And I was like, if only I did what my wife did. <laughs> but I realized that she even uses maps differently than me. I hit go and it gives you turn by turn directions. She stays zoomed out because she likes to see the whole thing. And I realized that most of us are probably like one of either of those ways. And I just wanted to take a moment for those of you that need the zoomed out picture to tell you what are, what are we doing? What are we talking about? Why are we using this cultivate language? Um, because the, the, the zoomed out view is that we are, yes, we're in a series right now called Cultivate. But this is actually part of a much bigger ecosystem here at Makers Church that comes out of John 15, 16, which says that we would go and bear fruit that would last. And in an effort for us to create environments that would help us do that, Pastor Mark and our team have been working really hard on what we're calling a growth pathway or a discipleship journey that would really help us to get into the right environments so that we could grow and see fruit on our life that would last. It's not a workshop, it's not a class, it's not a Bible study, it's not a uh, self-help group, it's not um, just information. It is all of those things, but more importantly, it's, it's a life-on-life -life, uh, journey and experience that we're going to make available to our church here in the summer. And we've been working on it now for a couple years, and what we're in right now is kind of the content piece of Cultivate. For those who need the zoomed out view, you're like, I see it, I got it. And for those of you that need the turn by turn, you're like, dude, just give the sermon, right? Um, but I just wanted to let, give you a roadmap of kind of where we are and where we're going. And so what we're in in this next several weeks of this sermon series is the conversational and the content piece that will become um, the guide for the different experiences that will come alongside of this Cultivate growth process that, we, that we'll make available here in the summer. So I hope you're looking forward to it. Um, it's been a long time coming, and we're excited to continue it on. Ultimately, we're trying to do what the Great uh, Commission and the Great Commandment has called us to do. And we're really trying to find environments where we could learn to obey the things that, he, that God has commanded us to do. Like, let, let's not just hear it. Let's not just agree with it. But how can we actually obey? How can we actually do the things we believe God is calling us to do? And so this morning, I'm going to continue this conversation that um, Pastor Mark kicked off two weeks ago. Uh, one of the, I think, most insightful points that he made is that uh, not only healthy things grow, that unhealthy things can also grow in our lives. And last week, Pastor Shalise talked about this idea of planting with purpose and talked a lot about the parable of the sower, which is kind of the, the, the guiding passage for this whole experience and, and how we actually can become the good soil that, that the seeds that God wants to plant can grow in. And so if you missed any of those messages, I'd highly recommend you go back and catch up on them. But today, what I want to talk about is selecting seeds, selecting seeds. That's the title of this talk. If you go back to the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, it begins like this. It says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And that's it. That's the passage I want to preach on this morning, that a farmer went out to sow his seed. 
in the parable, we can see from the very beginning, from the outset, that the farmer had a plan. He was planting with purpose. He knew exactly what kind of crop he was trying to produce. And so he had seeds in his hands. He says that he went out on purpose. He had a plan. He was intentional. He went out to plant these seeds. Now, I do have some questions about why some fell out of his hand and fell on the rocky soil and some fell in the weeds. Um, I don't know the answer to that. But I do know that he knew what seeds he had in his hand that he was trying to plant. And so today I want to talk about what would it look like for us as Jesus followers to select the right seeds? It's almost like the matrix. It's like the blue, you have the blue pill or the red pill. I've never seen the matrix, but I know that part. Um, I know. Um, I don't do sci-fi and like that kind of stuff. But um, this, is, this is the choice that I kind of want to lay out before us, that we have the opportunity. Now, there are many different kinds of seeds that we can plant in our life, and there's different kinds of fruit that can grow from those seeds. But to, to really make it simple for us this morning, I want to talk about the choice between the two different seeds, the seeds of the flesh or the seeds of the spirit. And the scriptures help us with this. They, they, they help us understand that this, this idea that selecting seeds is one of the greatest responsibilities that we have in our life. The things that we choose to plant are what will grow up and be on the fruit of our lives. And we can see it played out here in Galatians 5. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit then you are not under the law. So here we can see the, the risk of planting the wrong kinds of seeds. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't just need to read about it, we know about it, right? Because we, we have planted all sorts of seeds in our lives that grow up into fruit that won't last, into fruit that, that will die, into fruit that is, is unhelpful or isn't healthy, and selecting and planting the seeds is the beginning of where we will see that fruit come from. But the problem is, is some of the most unhealthy fruit is the most delicious. Some of the most unhealthy fruit is the most desirable. And, and the easiest to grow. It, it grows like wildfire. It grows like Weeds, And so oftentimes, using the, the, the metaphor here in the scriptures, when we plant the seeds of the flesh, it says that the fruit is obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Well, that's a list. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of of God. Now, if you're like me, it's easy to like th hear one of those things and go, I've never done that. I've never seen that fruit on my life. And so you just dismiss all of it. You're like, uh, witchcraft, never done it. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, orgies have never been a thing. Um, there's some, there's some stuff in there. Uh, even like, I don't know, Factions, like that sounds pretty hardcore until 2020. But anyways, um, it's easy to like throw all those out. But, but, but if you take a closer look, you're like, oh, oh, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah, idolatry. I mm, think I know that one. Jealousy. Mm. Fits of rage. Uh, some of you, after you became drivers, some of you after you became parents. Um... <laughs> Selfish ambition, I, I know that fruit. I've seen that. 
And you can see that the, the, the option, the, the seeds we select, they really matter. And they will produce the kind of fruit on our lives that eventually we will have to reconcile and deal with. So the other option that the scriptures lays out for us is that we have this ability that, that we could choose to plant the seed of the Spirit. What is the seed of the Spirit? In the scriptures, if, if, you, if you look into the beginning from the very origin story of God and us, it says that he breathed his breath into us. And, and later on, we'll see that, that the ruach or the pneuma is the breath of God. It is, it is the spirit of God. It is his words. It says that he spoke the world into existence. So his breath, his spirit, his word, it's all the same thing. So what would it look like for us to plant the seed of the Spirit? And then we see what happens. We see the fruit that grows up in our lives if we choose to plant these seeds. It continues on. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the breath, the fruit of the ruach, the, bruth, the, 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 the fruit of his word is love and joy and peace and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, since we live by his breath, since we live by his word, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us keep in step with his breath. Let us keep in step with his word. Now let's go back to the, the parable of the sower. Because so many parables that Jesus lays out, he never explains, but this one he does. And I don't know if that's good or bad. Sometimes it's nice to leave your imagination up to, what did he mean by that? But in this one, he continues on in Matthew 13, verse 18, and he explains what this parable means. And he says, listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, when anyone hears about the message about his kingdom, what he's talking about in, the, in this parable is that, that God himself is the farmer, and that God is trying to plant something. And the thing he's trying to plant is his, is his message. It's his word. It's his spirit. It's his breath. What he's trying to plant. What he's trying to get into us is his word. And when we plant the seeds of his spirit, the seed of his word, the fruit of that spirit... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, you know, the good stuff. The fruit that we want to see on our lives. So the question I want to ask this morning is how are we planting that seed? How are we planting the message of the kingdom? How are we planting the word of God in our lives? If you've been around church for a while, if you've been around faith of of any kind, you'll know that with every kind of faith or every religion, there's a sacred text. And if you've been around the church for a while, you're like, I know where this is going. Pastor Derek is going to tell me to read my Bible. <laughs> is that why I came to church this morning? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, but more. Yes, but more. Is the Bible essential? Is it important for us to read and interact with? The answer is a resounding yes. It's a must. If we're going to plant the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of his word, the fruit, I'm sorry, if we're going to plant the seed of his Spirit, the seed of his, his breath, we must engage the Scriptures. There's really not any way around it but there is a lot more to it. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. What does it look like for us to plant the seed of the Spirit? 
And here at Makers, we have a, a list of belief statements, and one of the, those belief statements says this. We believe the Bible is our manuscript. The scriptures are God's authoritative word to us. So does the Bible matter? Yes. Do we wish, do we hope, do we think that every single one of us who is on a journey towards Jesus would engage that text? Yes. If you don't have a copy of the scriptures, we would love to give you one today. Or you can download it for free on your phone. But it's beyond that. It's not, I wish I could say, just read your Bible. Read, just read your Bible. But why, why doesn't that suffice? Why, why, why isn't just reading the Bible the best and only way to plant the seed of the Spirit, the Word of God, the breath of God, the Spirit of God in our life? Why, why would just reading the Bible fall, fall short of that? The, the Scriptures is an incredible look into the Word of God, into the story of God. But I'm going to say something that's probably controversial in a lot of spaces. We don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Why? Well, because the Bible itself says that Jesus is the Word of God. That Jesus himself is the word of God. We're going to unpack that more in a little bit. But the Bible points us to, to Jesus who is the word of God. So it's essential in helping us get there. But if you're like me, engaging the Bible is hard. Like how many readers are in the room? Readers? Yeah. You ever tried to read the Bible cover to cover? Pretty hard. How about non-readers in the room? Yeah, me too. I, I, I struggle with reading. I struggle with reading. I'm a very slow reader, and I'm a ridiculous thinker. <laughs> I'll overthink every word I read. And so reading the Bible at face value, very, very challenging for me to this day. And I think one of our biggest problems in in the church or that I've experienced is that we've distilled it down to just, hey, just read your Bible. And we've even tried to make it really concrete or really simple and say, yeah, just start your day with the Bible. Start your day with the Word of God. Man cannot live on bread alone. And we throw all these things out at people and we're like, yeah, just do it. Like, like it's a Nike ad or something. But it's, it's, it's not that simple. Even if you're an avid reader, but does it mean that in order for us to be people who have fruit that lasts on our lives, that we can neglect this peace? I, I don't think so. But I do think that, that one of our problems has been our approach is we have treated the scriptures with a Greek mindset. That the scriptures are like the Wikipedia of God. That the scriptures are the place where we can go out to find information out about God. That, that we, we treat it as, as if it is like the, the, the best truth frozen in time. In fact, there's a, a very famous theologian who said that the Bible is truth frozen in time. And what I want to submit to you today is that if the Bible is just the best recorded information about God, then we're wasting our time. If it's just the best recorded information about God, we're wasting our time. Because when you look at the story of the scriptures, what the scriptures are telling us is that God speaks. Not that he spoke. That God is speaking. If we want to plant the seed of his spirit, if we want to plant the seed of his breath, the seed of his word in our lives, that we must approach the scriptures as a portal into the very presence and essence of who God is. And the truth of that is that God speaks. Listen to what, what Hebrews 1 says. It says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And through whom also he made the universe. 
The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Listen to this. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. If we want to be people who have fruit on our lives that lasts, would we not go to the source that sustains all things by his powerful words, Jesus himself? Well, what the scriptures are saying is that, that God is always speaking, that God has been desperately trying to get our attention from the beginning of creation. And that in our negligence, he keeps finding new ways to speak to us. And the prophets, it even says this in Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature, there's a lot of things, have been clearly seen being understood from stuff. Stuff that has been made so that people are without excuse. That all of creation, all of the universe is declaring God's invisible qualities. That we can see the invisible qualities of God in the visible. That God is making himself known to us. That God is longing for us to hear from him. That God is speaking and trying to get a hold of you. And listen to what it continues to say in Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God, which I, I believe is Jesus himself and the scriptures that help us understand who Jesus is. For the word of God is living and active Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You ever feel found out? If you've never felt found out, this should make you feel found out. And it should also encourage you that God is trying to speak to us through his spirit in our very own spirits. You ever been frustrated? You just can't hear the audible voice of God? I've prayed for it a million times. God, tell me what to do. I need to hear from you. Like audibly. Like I'm desperate. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. I don't even know if you're there. And if you could just audibly say something, I would have a lot easier time believing that you are. You ever been there? But the scriptures say that the word of God is living and active. Yes, it's something written down in that book. We can learn to hear the voice of God by seeing how he interacted with his people and how we responded to him. We can see the nature and, and the essence of who God is through the written word of God. And we must, we shall, we must find a way. Even for those of us who suck to read, we're not good at it. We must find a way so that we can learn to hear his voice. Because when he is separating, like a, like a two-edged sword, piercing and dividing soul and spirit, how do you even do that? Well, God can through his power of his spirit, through his word. And oftentimes we hear God deep in our soul. Now sometimes we're not sure it's God and he's given us each other. Wise counsel, discerning body, affirming people, people that are around us to go, dude, I think you're crazy. Or, yeah, it's aligned with the essence of God, the character of God, with who we think he laid out us to become might be God. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. This is what I want us to leave here believing today. Is that when God speaks, there's life. Well, why do I believe that? Well, because I made a decision at some point that I was going to trust what the scriptures say. And the scriptures start we're saying, in the beginning, he said, and it was. In the beginning, he said it, and it was. 
He said it. He spoke it. It was. And then he says all sorts of things about us in the scriptures. And I decided many years ago that I was going to believe what the scripture said. That, that I and that you were designed in the image and likeness of God. That there's an inherent worth and value to every human being. That God loved us so much that his love would call us to repentance. That he loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like when you choose to believe those things are true, it changes you. It sustains all things. Those are, are words that are true. And I, I believe this, if you do not hear God speak, if you don't take time to listen to God, to listen for his voice, to allow it to permeate the deepest part where he can divide between soul and spirit, then we will never truly know life. Because the scriptures teach us, and what I've experienced firsthand is that the voice of God breathes life, breathes life into us, and it grows something in us that can produce a fruit that will last. I know many of you are thinking, but how? What do I do next? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you need to do next. I do not have a Bible reading plan laid out for you, although there are many. I do not have uh, the number one podcast I'd recommend. However, the Bible Project is pretty great. I don't know what your past is or what your current practice is. But I do know that there's a posture that we can take on. And we can posture our tw ourselves towards God and say, Lord, I need your breath. I need your spirit. I need your voice. I need to plant that kind of seed in my life. Now, before everyone leaves thinking I'm blasphemous by saying the Bible is not the word of God, I just want to talk about John 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God, the word was Jesus. It refers to Jesus himself as the word of God. That Jesus, and this is what I want to leave here knowing, is that we believe here and I believe in the very depth of my being that if we would place our eyes on Jesus, if we would follow him with our lives, if we would do the things he told us to do and he longed to become the people he invited us to become, that Jesus, the word of God, that his breath, his spirit will divide between our soul and spirit and it would be the best kind of seed that we can plant in our lives. When we begin to live our lives on the story of the scripture, we begin to model our lives after the person of Jesus, we begin to know that what he says is true. And, and I, I want to kind of start driving towards the end with this idea. The story that you find yourself in matters. The story that you find yourself in it matters. And there are all sorts of stories we can place ourselves in and begin to believe that will shape a view and a reality of who we are that is untrue. But the scriptures are a beautiful story that we can find ourselves in. It's the story of a murderer named Moses and a liar named Abraham, a prostitute named Rahab, an adulterer and a murderer named David. This dude we celebrate that wrote the Psalms and all the good stuff. It's about these deeply broken, messy people who God still gave a chance to. That God still redeemed and used for his glory. And when we can find ourselves in that story, we can believe and begin to, to move in a place that will bring life and fruit that will last. And so I want to pick a fight with Pastor Mark here for a second. One, because he has a 49ers sweater on. And two, because I'm really frustrated that part of Mark's testimony is that he came to know Jesus by reading the Bible. It's a really powerful and beautiful testimony, but it isn't mine. 
Because I met Jesus long before I ever cracked the book. And I think a lot of times we can, we can begin to trip over what's the right way. There is no right way. There is the way that God finally gets through to you. And when you begin to hear his voice and you become obedient to his voice, everything begins to change. For Pastor Mark, the, the scriptures is how he really came alive and saw Jesus. For me, I simply read the scriptures because this Jesus guy like wrecked my life in the best of ways and I needed to know more about him. So for the last like 20 plus years, I've fumbled through the book to make sense of who he is. And what I want you to leave here knowing today is that God is speaking to you. He is desperately trying to get a hold of you and he desperately wants you to listen. I think the Bible at some point is going to make its way into that, 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 that journey, to that voice. I don't know where that is for you. Many of you have read the Bible so many times you don't need to read it anymore. That sounds blasphemous. But if you know the voice of God, doing the same thing over and over again that you used to do may not be the way that God wants to get through to you. Or maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time and you've never really given the Bible a good like college try. And there might be some rhythms or practices that, that you can begin taking on that would help you understand the voice of God more clearly. But I want to end with this. If the scriptures are, are truly a portal into the person and presence and character of who God is, at some point, they need to make their way into our journey. It needs to become a seed that we, that we plant. But when you talk about the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of the breath, the fruit of the word of God, and you talk about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, those are all things that I really want in my life. And if you're like me, you'll try to take the shortcut. And you'll be like, I, I need some more patience in my life. So I'm going to be more patient. And you'll plant the seed of patient. And you become so constipated with your seed of patient that you'll become more impatient that you haven't become patient yet. And you'll see the fruit that you want on your life, and you'll try to just go get that fruit instead of plant a seed that will produce it. Or maybe you're like, I need to be, I need more self-control. I've got no control. Thank God it's New Year's. I'll set a resolution. I'll be done with it in 12 days because we have no self-control. You can't plant a seed of self-control. You say, oh, I want to learn the, the I want to learn the, I want, I want the fruit of, of generosity on my life or of, 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 of being gracious or, or good. And we'll try to plant those seeds. But if, if you look at what the scriptures say as it leads into that point, I just want to end with this. And this is the challenge. In Galatians 5.13, it says, You, my brothers and sisters, are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. That, that word, that word, that breath, that is the very essence and spirit of what Jesus is speaking to you and to me constantly, and he's inviting us into. And I desperately believe this truth. If you want patience in your life, you plant the seed of love. Get married. Have a kid. <laughs> love them well. And your patience will grow. You want to be more gentle? Plant the seed of love. Enter into a friendship or a relationship that is going to challenge you and call you to more. What love is simply 
is laying our desires and our wishes and our wants down for the good of someone else. And if for whatever reason, it's, it's, it's upside down, but that can bring about the most joy you've ever experienced in your life. Choosing to love someone, to lay yourself down, to put them as more important than yourself. It produces a fruit of joy that you cannot make sense of. Kindness, you want to be more kind? Do you get the picture? You can't just try to be kind. But you can put someone before yourself, and the fruit of that is kindness. See, God will speak to you all sorts of different messages. God is trying to get through to you in whatever way he possibly can. Yes, I think at some point in the way, the Bible, the scriptures are going to find their way into there. We'd love to help you with that. But more importantly than how God is speaking is what he's saying. And the one thing that can't be missed is that he's called all of humanity to love one another as yourself. And this is a seed of that we can select today. This is a seed that we can choose to plant that will grow fruit on our lives that will last, that will grow fruit. If we want to be transformed, we could start today with planting the seed of love. This is from the voice of God. Would you pray with me? God, I believe it. I think most of us here believe it. That you are desperately trying to get through to us. Because you love us. And in your love, God, we even see you laid yourself down. So that we could have life. And it's amazing how reciprocal that invitation is, God. That you would ask us to do the same. That the very best way we can be obedient to you, the very best way we can follow you, is by loving others as ourself. God, that's a seed that I know we can plant. That's a message that I know you want every single one of us here. That's not unique for me or for any one of us. That's for all of us. Could you have so much more to say? You have so much more to say, and we want to hear it. But God, we pray that you'd give us the courage to practice that. Because I think, God, I really believe if we could start there, your voice is going to become ever increasingly clear. God, would you produce fruit in our lives that lasts? It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to end with one more thought. One more thought. When we select seeds and we plant seeds, I'm going to be my, I'm going to channel my inner Shalice. When you're a true gardener, you'll know something about companion planting. Companion planting is selecting the right kind of seeds that will help the other kind of seed grow. For an example, if you have like a fragile uh, crop that is going to grow and it needs cover, you'd, you would plant a taller crop that would shelter it in the shade or there's some crop or there's some plants that will shield off pests or some plants that will nurture and help the other seed grow and I I really think that this metaphor of companion planting is necessary for us to make sense of when we talk about selecting the right kind of seeds because we not only need to select the right seed the spirit the voice the the message of who God is for our own lives but we need to plant ourselves alongside of other people who are doing that Because those companion seeds, those companion plants that grow up around us will be essential to our fruit lasting. And to make the metaphor really clear, that is simply choosing who you plant your seeds alongside of. And so the invitation for that is to say yes to community. To say yes to a people who are running hard after the same thing, after Jesus, trying to hear his voice, discern his voice. And that comes in the form of saying yes to those around you and journeying together. You cannot go it alone. And so say yes to other seeds being planted alongside of you. Let's continue to worship.